As I was getting ready for tonight's meeting, I looked over the list of speakers that we've had in the past at the Conservative Forum to see when was the last time we talked about the Second Amendment or gun rights. Turns out, in our 10 year plus history, this topic's never been on the agenda. Tonight's the first time. Let me begin by reading to you the actual text of the Second Amendment of the Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Let me set the stage further with a few quotations to put this right in context. Martin Luther King once said, the right to defend one's home and one's person when attacked has been guaranteed through the ages by common law. Clint Eastwood offered up this gym. I have a very strict gun control policy. If there's a gun around, I don't want to be in control of it. <laughs> Larry Elder gave us this pungent observation. A woman who demands gun control legislation is like a chicken who roots for Colonel Sanders. <laughs> And then there's this from Nelson Lund of the Heritage Foundation. The right to self-defense and to the means of defending oneself is a basic natural right. The Second Amendment, therefore, does not grant the people a new right. It merely recognizes the inalienable natural right to self-defense. Our speaker tonight is a longtime advocate for this critical right, which is enshrined in the Bill of Rights. He's a California native from born to immigrant parents in 1956. He has worked with and for a gun owners of California for 34 years and has served as its executive director for more than a decade. He's given dozens of workshops and presentations to gun clubs and other conservative organizations on topics like confrontational politics and effective communications. He's front and center on the issue of gun rights as Mark Tauber shared with you earlier. And he's testified in hundreds of legislative committee hearings to try to slow the steady erosion of these rights in California. Please help me welcome Sam Freitas. Give me a stage, a forum, a lot of willing ears, and I can go on for a long time, but I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm going to put a little bit of a timer here to keep my, uh, try to keep my thoughts focused and, and interesting for you. First of all, you don't understand how, how big an honor it is to, to be here and be able to, to, to share these things with you folks. Um, wow, you folks pre-existed the Tea Party. Conservatives getting together, excuse me if I, in the, in the Bay Area. <laughs> who have been getting together for more than 10 years to learn, to, to, to give a forum to people that can encourage you to, to fight for your conservative uh, position and, and our constitutional rights across the board, all of our freedoms and liberties are shown in those documents. And even our founding fathers would tell you, we're not giving you rights. We are enumerating the rights that pre-existed the formation of this government. That's how important they are. So for me, I, I'm, I'm in a perpetual state of goosebumps up here, folks, just uh, being able to share with you. I looked at the, the posters of all of the people that have been able to, to present before you, and, and I'm really humbled because a lot of my heroes are down there. And um, I hope that, that I will be worthy of, of sharing information with you that is as valuable as, as some of the people that have presented before, uh, before me. First, let me take care of my commercial. In the back afterwards, oh, uh, before I go on, Mark Tober, I love you, man. You are, you are an incredible. And, and here's the start of the commercial. If you want to keep up to date on what's going on in a real-time, face-to-face situation, go to Harry's Hofbrau, and they have the Second Amendment, Golden State Second Amendment uh, Council meetings. Not only will you get a great meal, because Harry's makes great food, 
Uh, but you'll 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 be up to speed on the latest information uh, that is available on what you can do to, to to fight for your Second Amendment rights. And you're amongst people who share the same feelings as you. I see a lot of my friends here who who, who are members there. And and, and I want to thank you and commend you and, and, and ask God's blessings on you being here, cross pollinating with this with this organization. That's a, a really good thing. But in the back. Uh, I've, I've got our gun owners California brochures, tells you what we do, what we've been doing. Inside is a uh, quick cheat sheet on the uh, most key pieces of legislation that are still in the legislature. If you don't know, the Capitol critters are back. They've taken their July vacation and they're back in the legislature legislating, doing their thing, everything they can to infringe on our rights, of course, but uh, but they're there. Also in the back, um, Senator H.L. Richardson, some of you might remember him, served the state legislature for 22 years, came in uh, with uh, that young actor guy, what's his name? Ronald Reagan, yeah, when he, when he was elected governor. Um, and uh, actually, I, I, I like to credit Senator Richardson for, for being one of the guys who helped make uh, Ronald Reagan more conservative as his career progressed, um, and, and that's a that's a great thing. But he's written a couple of books. One is Confrontational Politics. Um, it's a book on how we do politics and why we do it and how we win. Really interesting. I put on um, workshops that go like six or eight hours talking about this kind of stuff. And if you're if you're a political geek like me. Uh, you'll find it fascinating. Probably nothing in there that you don't already know, but when you put it all together, you have those aha moments when you say, that's why that works. That's why I need to be doing this or that or the other. That's why I need to be getting together with folks. The, the second book that we have is actually the first book that he wrote. It used to be called Slightly to the Right. He renamed it Tea Party Talk. And what this book is, is a guide on understanding controversial subjects and being good at an argument. How to win arguments, how to win debates, how to be a more effective speaker. As one of our earlier speakers said, uh, you know, some people hate to speak. Uh, most people hate to speak until they realize that they're good at it, and then they, they learn to warm up to it, and they get better and better. This little book will be a great guide in helping you to become a better uh, speaker or just a better debater, you know, across the fence with your neighbor, that liberal neighbor of yours, you always get together and you talk about issues, and they always kind of go like this. Well, you do a little bit of reading here and you shape up your, your skills, all of a sudden they're going to be going, oh no, I'm not going to talk to them anymore because I just got my hand my handed to me in a basket, you know. Uh, and then the, the, the Third book I have back there is California Gun Laws, A Guide to State and Federal Firearms Regulations by my buddy Chuck Michelle, who is the one of the top gun uh, attorneys in the country. And what this book is, last year, this book was about that long. And then after they passed all of the laws last year, the book is now this long. And it's actually a pretty easy read. It's every law that will affect you as a gun owner in California explained. In English, not in not in legalese. Um, laws that affect you under federal laws and under state laws, because sometimes a state law will affect you, but not a federal law. But you lose your gun rights, and sometimes a federal law will affect you, but not your the state law, and you lose your gun rights. And you need to know what those laws are. These they cost us fifteen dollars. That's what I've, I've got them for back there. These cost us five bucks a piece, and if anybody wants them, we appreciate the donation, it helps pay for gas, and so we can reprint several thousand more and spread them around. And uh, we're well over 100,000, probably closer to 200,000 copies of this uh, confrontational politics nationwide. This, who knows how long, it was uh, on the conservative bestsellers book when it was slightly to the right back in the 60s when he wrote it. So uh, uh, have that available, that's my commercial. For those of you who don't know, Gun Owners of California is the oldest pro-gun political action committee in the country. Senator Richardson started us back in 1975 when the first bill was introduced in the state legislature to ban handguns. It was sponsored by 
uh, a knucklehead from Southern California, Alan Cerrone. He was a senator. And an assembly goofball from Oakland named um, Nick Petrus. Some of you might remember old Nick, Lefty Nick, a commie Nick, and he was proud of it. Uh, well, it was the first bill to ban guns. And, and this was just after the Watergate situation with President Nixon and, and Congress and all of the states, they passed this stuff called campaign finance reform. And they created these animals called political action committees. But nobody knew how they worked. Senator Richardson figured it out. He was sitting as a board member of the National Rifle Association, and he went and said, hey, do you guys care if I start one of these packs? And they said, packs like backpacks or mule packs or no, no, political action committees. And he said, uh, they sponsored a gun ban bill in California. He said, he said go ahead, Bill. And so he started the, the pack. In the first year of operation, we had over 300,000 individual contributions to the direct mail had never been done before. Nationwide. First time. Over a million dollars were raised. Today that would be closer to eight or nine million dollars equivalent. And we used it to absolutely scare the stuffing out of the lefties in the legislature. As a matter of fact, from 1976 to 1989, GOP in California stood for Gun Owners Party. Because anybody who sponsored an anti-gun bill or voted anti-gun, we went after them. And we defeated a whole bunch of them. Democrats, Republicans. Heck, we elected some Republicans who were pro-gun as candidates. And once they got there, and all of the lobbyists started saying, gee, you're such a nice guy. Oh, that, that was a really funny joke, and how are your kids, and how do you want to go on this vacation, you know, we'll cover this, and oh, dinner's on me, and all of a sudden they started to waffle a little bit. Well, we reminded them that it was gun owners' money that got them to the dance, and we took them off the dance floor. Actually replaced them with other, with, with other candidates in primaries, and we were willing to do that. People said, you're going to challenge people that you have to elect? You're darn tuned we are, and we did. Consequently, if you don't know that most politicians that are in, in, uh, in uh, the, the state legislature, they have a little bit of a scaredy cat bone in their back. And when they think that their next election might not turn out so well, they start to uh, vote right, if you know what I mean. And so we've done that for a long time. Well, we were so good at it. They changed the laws. We used to give candidates sometimes 25, sometimes 50%, sometimes 100% of the money they needed to get, election, uh, to get elected, we would provide that for them through gun owners' donations. The, the lefty Dem said, no, 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 we can't do that anymore. We're going to limit the amount of money that anybody can give to $3,900. That's up to $4,100. So a political action committee can no longer give $40,000, $70,000, $80,000, like we were giving to candidates. They were limited to $3,900, of course, unless you were a union, which means that you, you, you were unlimited in what you could do. Okay. But they changed the laws to try to make us less effective. So it took a little bit of a little while. It took actually quite some time for us to figure out how to overcome the obstacles that they created for us. Well, we realized that gun owners in the state of California were our biggest resource. Not the dollars that they provided, but the people themselves. So we had a sterling example of what we learned last year in the 16th Senate District special election that occurred in, in Fresno, between Fresno and Bakersfield, for a state Senate seat. You see, this is a Democrat district. It was represented by a longtime Democrat in a heavily Democrat district. It was impossible for a conservative Republican to win in this seat. Impossible. Well, when the Democrat sitting senator uh, decided that he did not want to face an investigation into his tootsie footsie playing games with the oil companies, he quit midterm. He quit, just up and quit, resigned. Two weeks later, he became the vice president of Chevron Oil California. <laughs> True story. 
But that created an open seat, and under California law, meant that we had to have a special election. Okay. So we're pretty up to speed on what happens in special elections. We kind of watched what happened. There was one Republican, Andy Vidak, conservative farmer, rancher, small businessman. He'd run for Congress, um, almost took out a, 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 an arch, um, you know, uh, uh, Congressman Costa. He's been there forever. I mean, he's older than barnacles. And you know, the barnacles that have died and still stay on, and you can't scrape off. He's been there forever. Well, he almost took him out. And it was a better district. But he, he threw his hat in the ring, and there were six Democrats who ran. We were looking at this thing and saying, wow, we need to watch to see what happens in this race. Since Andy's the only, only Republican, let's see what happens. Well, the Democrats beat each other up. They were all lefties. I mean, all of them lefties. If they got up on stage and went like this, you could see the little mouth book in their, in their, in their <laughs> pockets, and the, you know, just the top of the little mouth book. You knew what it was. But uh, they, they were all at these, and they beat the heck out of each other. Boy, you think we're tough. They were nasty. And we watched that. Andy Vidak, as the only Republican, came within 350 votes of winning 50 percent plus one vote to win that election. So we kind of said, hmm, very interesting. Very interesting. We took a look at that race because now he didn't win. We had the top Democrat and, and Andy Biden. We took that race and, and, and we said, okay, how can we influence this race? Everybody, every newspaper, every consultant, the governor, the leadership in the legislature said, it is impossible for Andy Biden to win that race. We are going to pour, pour more money than Microsoft and Google combined into this race to, to keep it um, uh, a, a Democrat seat. It's impossible for Andy to win. And the numbers are so skewed. There's so many more Democrats involved. Well, we kind of said, mm -hmm, let's take a look at this race. I got together, uh, picked up the phone, and, and called several of the other major gun organizations. You're probably a member of, there are probably members of the organizations that we've coordinated with out here. But whatever. Alphabet Soup, uh, you're a gun organization you're a member of, we probably coordinated on this race. We checked to see how many gun votes, how many members we had in this district first. How many members? And then we decided to check to see how many people were interested in guns but weren't members. So we rented the list of shooting times and guns and ammo and guns and rifle magazine and hand loading magazine and all of those to identify names and addresses of people that were not members of all of our pro gun organizations. We bounced those names against our membership so we came up with a list. Now mind you, this district was a 70% vote by mail district. 70% of the votes were going to be cast by mail and the election had already started so the ballots had already been sent to people's mailboxes. So for us to communicate with people that have already received and probably already sent in their ballots would have been a waste. So we concentrated on only the 30% that we knew were going to vote at the, at the, uh, at the booth on, on Tuesday. So we got those numbers. We took a look at what we had. We bounced it against those that were registered to vote. And not only those that were registered to vote, but we also went and saw how many of these people that are registered voters are regular voters but did not vote in the primary. We came up with 22,000 identified pro-gun votes in that district. Democrat, Republican, in, Independent, no party preference, peace and freakies, whatever they were, they were all, all represented in, in, that, in that list. 22,000, so what did we do? We mailed to them, and the biggest thing, on the last weekend of the election, we had somewhere between five and 8,000 Tea Party volunteers that were scattered throughout the state of California that received in the mail a list of phone numbers and a script. And they called people from that 22,000 list in that district from all over the state. We had people calling from 
uh, Arcata, Reddy, San Diego, believe it or not, Los Angeles. We even had some from San Francisco that were calling in to these people. And, you know, earlier somebody said, yeah, doing a phone bank is, is like, oh, man, it's fingers on a chalkboard. It is, you know, the phone gets heavier and heavier. I was getting phone calls in the office saying, Sam, I've never had more fun making phone bank calls than ever before than doing this. Because when people realize that, hi, I'm a volunteer for Gowners in California, people on the other side said, wow, what are you calling me for? And then they explained to them about the election. And they got very excited. They got so excited they wanted to keep our callers on the phone longer than they needed to be because they needed to call somebody else. And people were making these calls from their own cell phones. And if you had a, a you know, unlimited long distance thing, it didn't cost anything. So they made these phone calls. In the last week, we contacted 22,000, all 22,000 people on the list. Tuesday came around. They were starting to roll out the red carpet. They were about ready to send the limousine from Sacramento to, to Fresno to get the Democrat candidate to bring her up as the triumphant winner chariots with streamers flying and all kinds of stuff like that. They got a shock. Anybody that won that election by over 3,500 votes. Everybody said it was an impossibility for that to happen. It was impossible. Not one out of a million times, zero out of a million times was it possible for that to happen. So we would kind of say, golly, that was a pretty big deal. You know, and people say, well, did you keep it a secret? How do you keep something a secret when you have 8,000 people making phone calls for you? <laughs> and you had 22,000 people get mailed in the district. No, we didn't keep it a secret. Did we tell anybody about it? No, we didn't volunteer anything to anybody. The media wouldn't believe it if we told them anyway. Heck, Andy Bidak wouldn't believe it if we told him. But what happened is afterwards, we wanted to say, okay, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We want to be honest. We don't want to blow smoke up anybody's skirt or pants or shorts or anything like that. We want to be honest. So what we did is we bought the results from this district of who voted in, the, in that uh, general election, the special. And we bounced it against the list of people that we contacted out of the 22,000. Well, much to our not very big surprise, well over 4,000 people that we contacted voted in that election. Now, mind you, they had not voted in the primary, but they voted in the general, and Andy won by 3,500 votes. That is how we are going to outsmart the knuckleheads that try to stomp on us and prevent us from winning elections. We are going to continue. <laughs> we are going to continue to do that. They can, they can tie us up and duct tape over our mouths and stuff, but they're not going to be able to stop us from doing what we're doing. They can pass all the laws they want. We will figure out liberty is that vibrant. People who, who want freedom and will fight for freedom will figure out a way to make it shine. And we just had a little bit of an opportunity to do that in that election. It taught us a very big lesson, and that's what we're going to do over and over again. So we've got multiple races throughout the state of California that we are now beginning to target to do this kind of a thing, to duplicate it. It's going to be a secret? No. Are we going to tell anybody? No. They don't believe us anyway, remember? And we're going to do it over and over again. And then when the candidates come up, and then we sit down and say, hey, you know what we did for you? We say, well, yeah, what did you do? Thank you very much. And, and we'll say, okay, and enjoy your time here. Please be good, or else we're going to come get you. <laughs> Elections are very important. And we have to be, we cannot allow the, the, the fact that the, the, the liberal anti-Constitution Democrats got a two-thirds majority. Remember, they only held it for about this long. Two of them have been convicted of, of, uh, of, of crimes, or one of them's convicted of crimes, one of them's charged as an international gun dealer and, and all kinds of other problems, and another one has been paying, having somebody pay for his daughter to do nothing at work, um, and, and all kinds of other problems, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There will be more things that happen. They can't keep it, but we're not going to let them keep it. We're going to help them to lose it. 
And first, what we're going to do is we're going to push them back in both houses away from the two-thirds majority, supermajority, and then we're going to chip away little by little. And we're going to get this state back because this state is too doggone beautiful, too doggone important, not only to this country, but to the world. We provide foodstuffs for more than half of America right here. We may grow more rice in California than they do in all of China. And they got two billion people there. The Japanese don't like to admit the fact that they import some of our rice and serve it as premium rice because that would be losing face that their rice isn't the best rice in the world. But they do it anyway. We provide the vegetables for the whole western United States and, and at the East Coast to get all of everything that we make. Every lettuce would, would make it to New York City. California is too important. Our kids are too important. We have our best, our brightest in the world coming out of here. That's why it's important to fight. We choose to fight on the Second Amendment. That's the issue that, that we can connect with people, their hearts and their minds, and bring them to the fight. Elections are important. The legislature, you know, if ever any of you happen to find yourself in Sacramento on a day that the gun bill is up, look, call me. I'm going to have some business cards over there. Call me, and I'll have you come to committee with me so that you can see what it's like to try to testify before these knuckleheads. They look at us like we're green, and we have three eyes and antennas going out. We sit there and testify before them, giving them the information that they required the government to, to generate. They passed laws to create these reports on gun crimes and violence and all of that stuff. Once that information is generated, we go before them and say, you see, guns are not the problem. And they sit there and ignore their own reports. Hey, our president right now has done that. How many of you have heard of the Center for Disease Control report on gun control that was released uh, just a couple months ago? Okay, I see one, two, uh, maybe a dozen hands out of a couple hundred people. The president, when he was doing all of, I'm going to do all of these executive actions, and I'm going to charge the Center for Disease Control to do a study to prove that gun control is the answer. Well, the Center for Disease Control did exactly what he told them to do, and they released a report that said, uh, gun control and gun violence, or reduction in gun violence, uh, are non, non, not connected. They have nothing to do with each other. As a matter of fact, gun control may contribute to gun violence in some cases. Whoops! How many of you, ABC, CBS, NBC, report that in, on all the news to, to let people know that CDC said gun control doesn't work? No. no. But that's what happened. So you go up before this legislature and you, you argue. People say, how can you do it? Knowing that, that they're ignoring you. Well, this is how you do it. You go in there and you understand that this is a job that has to be done, number one. Number two, your audience is not necessarily the knuckleheads that are sitting on the dais. It's the cameras that are rolling. It's the reporters that might do a story on you and get your information published somewhere. It's a staff member somewhere who's working on another piece of legislation and realize that, whoops, we're going the wrong way. It's the governor's office who's listening to every legislative hearing to make a decision as to what the governor's going to sign and what he's going to veto. It's the people that are there in the audience giving up of their days and their time, their work time to come to, to testify, to be a part of the process. And it is the judges, the judges in our courts, where we will never allow ourselves to be in a situation where we abdicate, we give up going to the legislature and casting pearls before swine. We will never be, we're just going to keep casting those pearls as, 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 because we have to. Because one of these days, we, we may find ourselves before a judge, and the judge says, you know what, we have a system of government that our founding fathers established. And it's a three-part government. Administrative, legislative, and judicial. And you folks chose not to participate in one of those levels, the legislative process. Why are you coming to us now for a remedy? You have no standing with us. 
They don't care that you were behind the eight ball, that you were facing insurmountable odds in the legislature. They care that you participated, that you were there, that you were part of the process. We'll never be caught in that situation where we will not have participated. Okay? Lord willing, in the Greeks don't rise, we might have participated in the election of that judge. <laughs> when those who do come for election, uh, we take a stand on, on, on those that are willing to be a vocally pro gun, pro second amendment. And then the court system. You know, I don't want anybody to leave here um, thinking that all is lost. Because it's not. We have a light at the end of the tunnel that is turning neon bright. For those who don't know, just a few years ago, the United States Supreme Court in Heller versus Washington, D.C., declared that the Second Amendment, for the first time in history, SCOTUS went on record to say that the Second Amendment is an individual right that every citizen has. And with regards to the Heller case itself, the court held that it is illegal it is unconstitutional for governments to prohibit people from having firearms in their home to defend themselves. Firearms in a ready state. In other words, the government might be able to require you to buy a trigger lock. They might be able to force you to buy a gun safe, but they can't force you to use it in your own home. If guns are not instantly and immediately available to you in your own home, government tries to prevent that, that is unconstitutional. Now, all of us in our own situation, given our own family situation, kids and, and, and family members who might, sh shouldn't be around guns, that's our own responsibility to be wise as to how we keep firearms in our own homes. That's part of freedom and liberty. But when the government tells you, you can't do it at all, don't even think about it, we're preventing you from exercising that right. That is wrong. That right was so important that a year and a half later, the Supreme Court accepted another case called McDonald versus Chicago. And they used that case as an opportunity to say that Heller, which actually applied only in federal enclaves, Washington, D.C., federal bases, federal units, federal properties, that that right was so important that it had to be incorporated to the states and local governments. In other words, State and local governments cannot infringe on that right either. It is an individual right, and they cannot prevent you from having firearms readily available to yourself in your own homes, if you so choose. Well, some of you might be thinking, well, San Francisco just passed an ordinance that said you had to use uh, you know, trigger locks and gun safes, you had to have your guns locked up. And the legislature last year, and Governor Jerry Brown signed two laws that said that in order to keep guns at home, you had to keep them locked up, keep your safety locked up. Their day's coming. Their day's coming. The court, we just have to remind the court of what they said and bring these cases specifically up to them, and they will be enlightened. And those laws will go on the trash heap of legal gobbledygook, along with all kinds of other unconstitutional laws that have been identified by the courts and thrown into the trash heap of history. <laughs> San Diego, San Diego Sheriff did not issue concealed weapons permits, would not issue them. He did, he, the state law said that he can ask, uh, he could decide whether your reason was good enough to have a concealed weapons permit. Did you carry a lot of money? Were you a jeweler? Did you, you know, did you take the payroll uh, from work to, to the bank? And, and people came up with all kinds of reasons as why they needed a concealed weapon. And still he wasn't issuing them except to his friends and cronies. Of course. Now, mind you, the sheriff of San Diego County, um, he used to work for the BATF, and um, he's the guy that gave the approval for the sniper to do the shooting on Ruby Ridge that took out um, uh, the mother and the, and, the, and the child. That's the sheriff of San Diego County. I don't understand how the people elected him, but they did. And so he continued to be his lefty self, and he did not want to issue CCWs, so 
he got sued. And of all courts, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, you know that the good Lord is looking down on us with a smile on his face. When the three judges that are picked to hear this ruling are one appointed by Clinton, eh, one appointed by um, Ronald Reagan, and one appointed by uh, George Bush. And if you read that decision, it was magic. It was artwork. It was one of the best arguments for the Second Amendment ever written in modern day. And what they held is the only constitutional reason, ex constitutionally acceptable reason, that somebody might have to use to want to care to bear a firearm concealed is for personal protection, self-defense. Nothing else is necessary. Doesn't matter if they carry money. Doesn't matter if they're a friend of the sheriff. If they want it for self-defense, they have met the constitutional standard, and you have to give them a permit if that's what the law says. And the sheriff kind of went, Kill. And now he's at least issuing uh, applications. <laughs> of course, of course, what happened with that case is that the, uh, they asked the sheriff if he wanted to, to ask for an en banc hearing. That means instead of three judges, they asked the appellate court to, to uh, um, bring in an 11-judge panel to rehear the case. They can overturn the three-judge panel or they can uphold it. And when the County Board of Supervisors of San Diego that magically got another Republican elected to the, to the Board of Supervisors did not want to spend another seven million dollars to appeal that, that case and they told the sheriff, you don't have the money to appeal it, the sheriff magically said, uh, I don't want to appeal it, I'll just let the ruling stand. And then of course, our illustrious Attorney General Kamala Harris, who had ignored this case completely from the get-go, didn't want to have anything to do with it, she came in and said, I want standing, I want to, to be able to ask you to hold the unbound hearing. The court says, okay. Uh, attorneys on both sides of the case, send me a 60 page uh, dissertation as to why we should or should not accept her request uh, to, to, to ask us for an unbound hearing. The, the attorneys did that, they submitted it. Now the court is going to decide whether to accept the fact that she has the right to ask for the impact hearing. If they deny it, the decision of the three-judge panel becomes the law of the land in the western United States, and the, the, those states that are encompassed by um, the Ninth Circuit Court, including Hawaii, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, Guam got its act together. They're one of the territories of the United States. The legislature said, hey, we don't need any, any more information than that. They passed a law requiring CCW shall issue on a shall issue basis, and the governor signed the law, and now Guamians have more of a right to carry a gun or, or, or more of an ability to carry a concealed weapon than they do in the city of San Francisco, in Guam, based on this ruling. So if the court says, yes, you have standing to ask us this question, to ask us to hold an back hearing. Then the court gets to decide, okay, are we going to say yes to her request or no to her request? If they say no, everything stays. If they say yes, then uh, they'll hold the 11 judge down. And we'll do it all over again. Our, our attorneys are saying, come on, get it over with. Let's go to the Supreme Court and make this law of land across the country. You know? <laughs> We are in a no-lose situation on this. Either that law stays the way it is and we have the right shall issue. If you want to conceal weapons permit anywhere in the state of California or anywhere in the western United States, you can go to your chief law enforcement officer and say, I want one for personal protection. And they say, okay, smile, say cheese, sign here, give me your thumbprints, and you're done. If the, if the panel says no, it goes to the Supreme Court and we already know the direction they're going in and they're leading with us. Two more cases that just happened a week and a half ago. One in the um, state of Florida, 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. There was a lawsuit brought by doctors because 
the state of Florida passed the law, and the governor signed this law that said the doctors, you cannot ask your patients if they have guns in the home. You cannot ask any questions about guns unless, unless gun ownership somehow impacts their health care, their direct health situation. If it doesn't, none of your business. They passed it. The doctors said, you're infringing on my First Amendment rights. I should have the right to ask my patients anything I want. <laughs> yeah, right. Except when you stomp on a, on a Second Amendment right. And, and the court said, no, you don't. So I was on, a, on an interview with one of the doctors that was running the, the drill uh, uh, from Florida, and, and it was funny. He was defenseless. Uh, you know, I said, what, right, uh, what kind of training do you guys have to be able to, to provide to your patients if, if they're youngsters and they have guns in the home? What kind of training, what kind of credentials do you have? What can you tell them? You, what, can, what do you know? Well, we know our patients, and we, we oh, okay, all right, all right, all right. Do you guys have pamphlets and, you know, that are probably generated by the National Shooting Sports Foundation or the National Rifle Association that talk about uh, gun safety in the home. Do you have any of those? No, we don't. Oh, okay, so you want to ask the question, but you don't really have a response except whatever you feel. Yeah. <laughs> you know where you can take your feelings. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, got it. The last case, uh, it was uh, Washington, D.C. again. You know, that, that government there, they want to stomp on, on rights any way they can, anytime they can, and they keep doing it, and they treat, keep, they're like cockroaches, you know, I know that's why I wear cowboy boots, because you can get in the corners, and even then you don't get them all. But, You know what? I hate it when that happens. <laughs> you have a brilliant, funny point to make, and it just kind of goes, that, that balloon just goes away. Well, the, the, um, Washington, D.C., they didn't have any sort of a CCW process. They didn't have, you know, you could, you could only keep a gun in your home. And there was a lawsuit that was filed in Washington, D.C. that said that, hey, the Second Amendment says you have the right to keep and bear arms, and Justice Scalia in Heller talked about the fact that bearing arms means keeping guns outside of the home. So the judge there, boy, how's that for time? The judge there took reference to um, the San Diego Peruta case and wrote an opinion that said the government of Washington, D.C. has got an unconstitutional law in place and the only remedy is to allow, because they don't have CCWs, well, that means that law-abiding citizens have the right to open carry loaded firearms in the District of Columbia. <laughs> that means Capitol Hill. That means in front of the Washington Memorial. That means in front of the White House. That means, you know, how cool would it be to stand there before the Lincoln Memorial? with your AR-15 <laughs> saying, you know, bah. You know, I'm a modern day civil... Oh, no, I won't say war between the states. I might start another fight. You know, <laughs> but, um, that's the law of the land. And of course, the government of Washington, D.C. said, oh, we, you're, what, what do you want us to do? We don't have time to fix this, you know. And it, you got to give us 180 days. You have to stay in your ruling. And the judge said, I'm not going to give you 180 days. I'm going to give you 90 days. And after 90 days, if you don't have a law that passes constitutional muster, I'm directing the chief of police of, the, of Washington, D.C. and the mayor to ignore this law and not enforce it against anybody. If for residents of Washington, D.C., if you have a legally registered gun, you can open carry it. And if you are a non-resident visitor of Washington, D.C., and you are legal, it is legal for you to possess firearms in your state, it's legal for you to open carry in Washington, D.C. That's what I'm going to do. you got 90 days. Start. <laughs> Folks, 
Those are just a couple of the lawsuits that we've got in place. It's only a matter of time before we get rid of all of the assault weapons bans. We get rid of the so-called safe handgun laws here in California that only mean that we don't get to have the safest, latest, greatest, newest, most efficient, most effective guns designed. We don't get to have them here because the state of California wants all guns to have politically correct features added to them like loaded chamber indicators and magazine disconnects and micro stampede, something that no gun has in the world and no manufacturer is willing to do it. We've got a bright future, folks. We've got lots of things going in our favor. Be involved, stay involved in the elections, calling your members of the legislature, finding out what's going on in the courts by contacting Gun Owners of California, National Rifle Association, uh, CRPA, Calgans, whatever your vehicle of information is, stay informed and be involved and let other people know. Now, like I said, I wouldn't want to leave here without answering any questions that anybody might have. So, Joel, have you got a, a list of questions? Okay, let's get, get to the getting here. Exercising the right. 
Somebody asked about a requirement that gun owners buy liability insurance. Another one talks about outrageous fees for an application to carry a concealed weapon. I've also heard of taxes on ammunition. This collection of costs, like poll taxes, are these burdens on exercising the right to bear arms? And, and are you guys aware of fighting that? Absolutely, folks. I, you're obviously conservatives because only conservatives would think that that deep. <laughs> we understand, you know, they're only that 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 shallow. You peel it off, and there's nothing but red meat there. You know, it's just uh, red paint or something. But uh, you peel us away, you see red, white, and blue for a, for a, for a long ways. Folks, this is our bottom line. The government cannot charge us to exercise a constitutional right. Any time that they do, any way that they do, charge us or infringe on our ability to exercise a constitutional right, there is a problem, and we're going to get to it. For right now, we're working on just making sure that the government and the courts accept the fact that we have a right to carry a concealed firearm in the state of California, and they can't prevent us to do it from doing that. Next, we're going to fight about the process, because some of those boneheads are going to try to make the process more difficult or too expensive. We've got court cases ready to go to fight those things, but we have to take one step at a time. We can't get it all in one bite. It's the old how to eat an elephant, one bite at a time. And never going to choke the whole thing down on one shot. Next one. Can you talk about SB 53 and what the consequences sure. might be for California gun owners? SB 53, ammunition registration bill. What this bill says is anybody, anybody who sells ammunition in the state of California will have to get a license and be registered with the Department of Justice in order to have the right, no, the privilege to sell ammunition. Now this is where we are all going to get treated like registered sex offenders. Because we are going to have to register with the state of California Department of Justice and get a two-year permit that will allow us to buy ammunition. We will have a background check. It's going to cost us $50 if you want to buy ammunition in the state of California. Then when you go buy ammunition, you're going to have to get your thumbprint, your name, your address, your serial number, your, your social security number. All of that information is going to have to be reported. And then it's going to be reported to the Department of Justice where they're going to compile those records. Now I know some of you folks are shooters, especially the folks that are here from the uh, Golden State Second Amendment Council. It's especially some of you folks that are trap shooters. I, I'm a handgun shooter, and a thousand rounds is about 45 minutes of, of, of almost excitement for me on the range. Okay? One of these days, they're going to go and, and check your name, and if you've been buying ammunition for 10 years, they're going to say, this person has 5,000 rounds of ammunition they purchased. Uh, maybe we need to go pay them a visit. What does anybody need 5,000 rounds of ammunition that they don't sell for five years? You know, So you're going to get a knock on the door. They don't realize that you buy ammunition, and then you shoot it, and then it's no longer ammunition. It's empty halls. <laughs> so that bill is a very dangerous bill. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we filed a lawsuit against uh, AB 962, which said that this kind of a registration thing was illegal, but it was because they were trying to find only and limit it only to handgun ammunition. Well, Senator De Leon decided to make it apply to all ammunition. But what we didn't tell Senator De Leon is that the judge took the first argument that we made and declared his law unconstitutional. If this law goes into effect and the governor signs it, we're ready to go to court again with 37 other reasons why this is unconstitutional. Joe. Any comments on the gun manufacturers leaving unfriendly states for states that are more welcoming. Holy smokes. Isn't it about time? You know? They, 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 folks, and, and you'll notice that it isn't some, some of the more corporate uh, gun manufacturers that are moving. It's those that are family-owned. Believe it or not, Beretta is family-owned, owned by the Beretta family. And they're, they're moving everything from Hackagink, Maryland, which is an anti-gun state, over to a neighboring state, and they're going to do all of their manufacturing there. It's happening more and more. More gun manufacturers are moving to gun-friendly states to make a statement, not because it, it's more difficult to manufacture guns in those other states. The other states want them there, even though they have anti-gun laws. They're making a statement. 
and it's costing anti-gun states a lot of money. And there are a lot of people that are losing their jobs and saying, hey, Senator, you voted to lose my job. When are you up for election next? I got 3,000 fellow residents who were working at this plant who now don't have a job thanks to you. So it's a great thing. It's a great movement, and we're going to hear more and more about that in, in the days to come, weeks to come. Is there more companies that are planning on moving? Joe. All right, I got a couple of a couple more similar ones I'm going to combine here. Why do we even need to ask the government for permission to exercise our rights? Aside from keep and aside from bear, there are so many laws that are definitely infringement. Why aren't those unconstitutional? Um, the, the answer to that is they are. People ask, you know, with all of these, these lawsuits and stuff like that, you know, some judges are using rational basis, some judges are using intermediate scrutiny, some judges are using strict scrutiny to define these laws that are passed that infringe on our rights. Our argument to them is that none of those need to be applied to the Second Amendment in particular because it has and contains in the writing of the amendment itself its own level of scrutiny and it says, quote, shall not be infringed. Period. Now, that's our goal. That's when we have arrived. And that's what we're heading towards. Nothing short of that. And it's a process and it's a fight. And we're going to get there. But we're, we, we're taking intelligent steps one at a time in order to build upon our victories and make it impossible for the courts to go any other way. Joel? There are many immigrants in my area who come from countries that have no gun rights. They have no experience with self-protection, especially guns. How do we reach them? They aren't pushing the Second Amendment in the public schools for sure. <laughs> you know how? Befriend a neighbor. Uh, take him to the gun range. All you have to do is take him to the gun range one time, and you've got a vote. I mean, ooh, what are you going again? I like to do that. Hey, I, that, that was fun with the handguns. How about those? big ones, you know, the, the rifles and shotguns, and you introduce them. Folks, if everybody here befriended one person in a year, an immigrant who's come to the United States in order to enjoy the freedoms and liberty that our founding fathers wanted us to have here, what the Statue of Liberty says, bring me your tired, bring me your poor, bring me your unwashed masses, of course, on, on what? We're hungry, you're in to be free. Thank you very much. You know what? It's our responsibility to welcome them to the United States and make them rabid Second Amendment defenders. Hey, if you have a friend that's, in, that's of Indian descent, remind them of Mahatma Gandhi and what he said. He's one of the top pro gunners in the world when he was around. When asked, what should you do when somebody assaults you with a gun? Well, a wise person will use a gun to defend himself, his own gun to defend himself. Mahatma Gandhi. Duh. That's wisdom. So that's an easy way to do it. Just befriend somebody. You'd be amazed at how, uh, how, how much fun you have. Joel. We hear about international treaties that could cause us to lose some of our gun rights. Any comments on the potential for the loss of sovereignty there? Sure. We always have to be vigilant against those who would give away our sovereignty. Always. Always have to. In the United Nations Small Arms Treaty, that thing's falling apart. This is why this is an integrated fight that we have to be involved in. We have to be engaged in the United States Senate elections to make sure that we continue to send people there who will never vote to give away our sovereignty, uh, uh, sovereignty through a treaty. It takes two-thirds of the United States Senate to ratify a treaty. And as long as they don't got two-thirds, they don't got nothing to put in the vernacular. or sheriffs to help them understand what the state or federal laws are related to guns. You know what? Um, I'm going to be really honest with you. Working with chiefs of police is probably the most difficult thing to do because chiefs of police are actually political animals that are appointed by a governing authority. A police commission, a city council, uh, a city manager, they, they are the ones who appoint the police chief and they will 
115% of the time reflect the political inclinations of their appointing authority or else they won't be appointed anymore. Sheriffs are a different thing. They answer to the people. We have had great success in reaching sheriffs. Now, I was criticized this week because we have been talking about a group of sheriffs that have called themselves Constitutional Sheriffs of, of, of California. And they are shall issue in their counties. They issue CCWs to anybody who requests one, as long as you're a law-abiding citizen. It is a continuing education process with them because before last year, before 2013, in the 33 years that I had been involved in the gun movement, I had never seen a city sheriff come to the legislature to testify on behalf of your Second Amendment rights. Never. Not one single sheriff. Last year, they were coming in droves. We had the sheriff of Del Norte County, Sheriff Wilson, come down and say, I hate to tell you this, folks, but any anti-constitutional laws you, you pass are not going to be enforced in my county. I don't know. sheriffs are taking that position, particularly in the rural counties, but they are working within their association to shed light and bring more education and wisdom to those people, the, the other members of the California State Sheriff's Association, including those that are that represent the urban counties. And remember, they're elected, and it's only a matter of time before we start getting to them too. So, uh, uh, yes, we are working very diligently with the sheriff. Sheriff Tom Basenko of Shasta County, we just recognized him as our Sheriff of the Year, made him an honorary member of Gun Owners of California. He's written letters to the legislature on behalf of constitutional sheriffs on every anti-gun piece of legislation. He's come to the Capitol every time we've asked him to. He has personally spoken with Jerry Brown for hours on the phone and in person about each of the anti-gun bills. So, yes, the answer is yes, we're doing, we're working very close to the sheriffs, chiefs of police. Joel. A couple of questions I'm going to combine again. People who want to see how far they could push the, the rulings that are already on the books. Uh, one person says, hey, with all these rulings, can I just go ahead and carry without a permit? Another person says, well, at least can I request a concealed carry in Santa Clara County and expect a favorable response? You know, the, the fact of the matter is that we have some sheriffs in the state of California who are going to hang on to that last vestige of power and authority they have to decide who gets to have guns in their county. They're going to hang on till they have no more fingernails. That's the case in Santa Clara County and, and some of the, the, the counties in, in, in the greater Bay Area and in, in Southern California. But ultimately, they're going to have to give way, and when they do, it's going to be a shock. Uh, and if they try to make the play the monkey business of making it too expensive or too hard or too long uh, for people to exercise uh, their rights, we're going to sue them again, and we're going to win. <laughs> no, the answer is you can't go out and do it on your own. Folks, you and I, we are the law obeyers. We obey the laws of the United States and the state of California because we know that's what we do. If we don't like the laws, we work to do something about it. We try to get them changed. We try to change the people that are making the laws, but we don't break the laws. We go to court to challenge the legality or the constitutionality of laws, but we don't break the laws. It's the other people who have no care about the laws who break the laws and have put us in the situation that we're in. We are not criminals. We are the law fighting. We are the ones that our founding fathers left this country for, and for our kids and their kids, if we do a good job of teaching them all about what's right, what's ethical, what freedom and liberty is all about. So, I think you may have already answered this one in your answer to the previous one. Do you happen to know how our sheriff in Santa Clara County, Lori Smith, has reacted to the San Diego ruling? Sheriff Smith um, said, I'm going to wait and see. Wait and see. Sheriff Smith, wait and see. And, and uh, sooner or later, Sheriff Smith is going to be issuing CCWs like hotcakes at a fireman's breakfast. So there's, there's no doubt in my mind. 
that anybody in Santa Clara County who wants a CCW, who is a law-abiding citizen, will be able to get one if we do our job right and we're patient with the court. <laughs> we have to learn to be patient with them. Unfortunately, if you haven't noticed, the courts are the only <clears throat> realm of government that, that it's kind of like, you know, they say in heaven the time doesn't make, mean anything. That, that it's kind of that's the way the courts state that they're in heaven and time doesn't mean anything. But uh, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do a ruling by this date. Well, that's I'm supposed to, but if I don't, it's okay because time doesn't really matter. Joe, when one of these laws is overturned, what happens to the people that were convicted or have lost their Second Amendment rights? That's going to be a lot of fun. Can you imagine how many how people are going to feel when they are vindicated? <clears throat> that when they realize and they, 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 they come before a judge and a judge says, I'm sorry, we charged you with an unconstitutional law, you are now free and your, your slate is wiped clean. That's going to be the result of a lot of people uh, that, that they're going to enjoy and we need to celebrate them we need to tell their stories so that it doesn't happen again. Joel. Before the next question, just a quick announcement. Apparently somebody left a pair of glasses at the registration table. So I've got them here if you're missing a pair of glasses. Can you comment on uh, what kind of grade your group might give to our two candidates for governor? Um, well, first, let's talk about Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown Redux. Second time around. People tried to say, you know, uh, Jerry Brown tells stories of his dad, Governor Pat Brown Sr., giving him duck guns, hunting guns, and rifles, and shooting guns on their property in Yolo County, and, and that Jerry Brown never signed an anti-gun law. And I was dumb enough to repeat that one time, but I was really super dumb enough to repeat that in front of Senator H.R. Richardson, who served. Uh, the entire time that Jerry Brown was governor, and it reminded me of a fact that while Jerry Brown was governor the first time, there wasn't a single anti-gun law that ever made it to his desk. Because at the time, gun owners in California were strong enough to make sure that we killed every bill in committee. And we did that. From 1975 to 1989, not a single anti-gun bill was signed into law in the state of California. It wasn't until 1989 that Governor George Duke Major signed the assault weapons ban. From that time, we were strong enough to fight them off. Things have changed, and we're rebuilding that strength. Now, Jerry Brown, uh, he, he, he called in a radio show, a sportsman's radio show, and said, hey, I'm going on guns. I'm going to protect your right to keep a bear arms and your right to hunt. I'm going to be good on all of that stuff. I think we have plenty of laws. And what did he do in his first year? He signed half the laws that made it to his desk. And then last year, last year we're, we're actually thankful. There were 40 bills that were sponsored. 12 of them made it to his desk, and he only signed six of them. <clears throat> and, and I was getting uh, newspaper calls, radio calls, and they're saying, Sam, aren't you happy that they only signed six laws? And I said, well, if you could be happy getting shot in the heart six times, uh, that's, well, I guess you could be happy. I'm not happy. I'm happy for the laws that he vetoed. No question about it. Those were no-brainers. These should have been no breakers too. But the fact of the matter is Jerry Brown is anti-gun. It's it's like you can't be you can't be an almost rapist. Lester, you, you, you either are or you aren't, and once you are, you are. And that's where Jerry Brown is. I'm not saying he's like a lester or a rapist, I'm saying he's anti-gun. That's his record. We don't know what he's gonna do. On any given day. Two out of three. Neil Kashkari was a candidate running for uh, uh, governor. Uh, and uh, in the primary election, uh, he was asked by a reporter, uh, where are you on, on guns in the Second Amendment? And he said, well, I own guns. I have guns. And, uh, and, and I like them. And I think we have, we have plenty of laws on the books on, on guns. Um, but if, if you're looking uh, for me to be, and I'm quoting him, if you're looking for me to be the gun guy, the Second Amendment guy, I'm not your guy. Uh, and he implied that Tim Donnelly was that guy. And he was. He is. Uh, he will always be. Uh, 
Tim Donnelly is an amazing guy. He's a personal friend. So he's out here. We don't compromise, number one. But we're also smart. I'll bet you every penny that's in my pocket that we will be able to influence the Ilkesh to the government. We will, we will have an impact on that. I will bet you, there's nothing I can bet you to tell you that we will influence Jerry Brown on anything. <laughs> nothing. Because we don't know. We can't. Where are we better off? Where are we going to make progress? And where are we not? Those are decisions that we have to make. So, being the fair and honest people that we are, we're going to have to weigh this decision in our hearts and in our minds. Meet the candidates, talk to them, see how they think, do the best you can. Follow, follow the leading that the, the divine gives you. I'll tell you what, there's no question about it, we'd be better off with him than we would do with your ground. I'm glad you should. But the good Lord wants us to use this as well as this. So let's do that. All right? Let's do that. I'm not asking you to vote for anyone. I'm asking you to use, your, to use wisdom. We don't come here with preconceived notions. We come here with a mentality of liberty and freedom and doing the right thing. And that's what we need to do. Any more? Joe? Yeah, i got two more and then we'll wrap it up here. Any thoughts on how we might get more favorable coverage in the media? Or, barring that, at least get the word out better. Has anybody noticed that ABC, CBS, NBC, PMS, NBC, <laughs> MSNBC, um, that they're, they, they've changed anchors? The studios aren't as pretty as they used to be. They aren't as elaborate. Um, they're losing market share like crazy. They are not able to charge what they used to charge for advertising on, on their shows like they used to do in the past. Why? Because they are losing influence. Don't allow yourself to go down the, the, the drain, the, the draining drain, feeling that, that the, the mainstream media is everything. We have got them in, in with Fox News and the internet and blog, we are contacting more people on a daily basis than all of those networks combined. Heck, Rush Limbaugh touches more people every minute than those networks combined do every minute. So, you know what? We're never going to get those boneheads. Why try? We're better than them already. We've surpassed them. Let's accept the fact that we have surpassed them. How many of you folks go to the internet for news, the computers and, and blogs and, and, and alternative sources of, you know, I wake up in the morning and Fox News goes on, you know, I say good morning to Hammer and, and McCallum, and, and they have such pretty girls, you kind of go, whoa! <laughs> uh, do not allow yourself to, to be, to, to, to feel badly that we're losing the and we're never going to get them. Fewer and fewer newspapers. You notice all the newspapers that used to be this big? Hang on, I, 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 I hurt my shoulder the other day, so I need help. They used to be this big when you open them and you read them. And then they got this big, and now they're, they're like tabloid size. And, and, and you get the grocery store ads in them, and that's about all. They're not even big enough to, to line your bird cages anymore, you know? You need to buy multiple copies of the paper to do that. They're losing influence, they're losing dollars, they're a dying breed, let them go, let them die all on their own. The best thing that you can do is not pay attention to them, not go to, to NBC, ABC, CBS and their, their affiliates, uh, their, their nationwide affiliates. You can still influence local affiliates and that's a good thing, that's a good thing. My name is, is in, in the, the business card file of probably every reporter in the state of California that does gun stuff. Why? Because I'm willing to talk to them. I'm not afraid to talk to them. To tell them the truth, and I try to make it fun to report. I call the members of the legislature knuckleheads. 
and, 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 and use quotes that make it fun for them to print or to do stories on, and they keep coming back. Any of them that are unfair, I never re re return their call again, and they don't like it. They keep trying to call. And I keep reminding them, remember, you misquoted me here. Goodbye. Never see you again. Bye. Never talk to them again. We've got them on the run. Let them go. Don't feel badly. Last question. All right. And a lot of members of our audience are interested in buying the books that you brought. So after this last one, if you could remind people how they can right connect with you afterwards. This last one actually is more of a comment than a question. Okay. Uh, from the audience, we've, we've had more than 100 speakers over the years we've been in business here. Most have focused on problems and challenges that we face. You are a breath of fresh air by telling us about the progress that we're making. Thank you.